Hello everyone. Um, Hi everyone. We're here with my friend Petros. Um, a lot of you on my channel asked uh, for an example interview question for uh, um, similar to, to the interviews that large companies do. So we are here to do an example question for you, which is going to take the full time of a, a whole regular interview question. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I've prepared um, uh, an interview problem for Petros. Uh, he doesn't know about the problem yet, so you will see the, the thought process that goes into actually problem solving and um, yeah, going through that interview. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so hey Petros, would you like to tell us a few things about yourself before we start? Um, okay, sure. So um, I'm currently working um, at Resin IO. Um, I'm, I'm founder and I'm, I'm mostly doing software engineering and you know, guidance of the technical architecture of, of the products. Um, yeah, I would say that's a uh, fair description, yeah. Cool. Okay, well then let's uh, get right into the question. Then. Sure. Okay, we have a whiteboard behind us that we can use. I think this... There. Do you have a marker as well? I do have a marker. Oh, okay, it's here. Yeah. Okay, so um, are you familiar with uh, Google Docs? Mm -hmm. Google's yeah. documents? Okay, so um, you've noticed that Google Docs, that um, you have a way to collaborate between many mm -hmm. different users. So the question today is, how, how would you implement such a system? Mm -hmm. So to describe it and then maybe discuss its architecture. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're trying to make a collaborative uh, document. Is this about just the Google Docs, not the spreadsheets? Or the yeah, yeah, just right. the word process. Right. Okay. Um, okay, so um, so there, there are various parts of the system um, that we can consider independently, so there will definitely need to be some sort of uh, messaging between, between the clients, so I would assume this is um, people connecting over with their browsers and you know, changes from one client need to be propagated to another, so there is needs to be probably something with WebSockets is the thing that pops into my mind right, right now. Okay. Um, the other part is, of course, how we will uh, represent the document and represent the changes. Uh, so that's one other thing, and I guess um, we can start with an age solution and, and then improve, improve that. Um, yeah, the other thing is that I'm um, thinking like what would be a good property for that system to have, and I'm thinking things like resiliency to if you if you go offline and miss an update, maybe it's it's self correcting. Yeah, that would be uh, nice to have. Okay, so well, yeah. maybe let's start with something really easy and see. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say that we have documents and users, but then we don't really care about the collaborative ability yet. So yeah. just, just the ability to store the document and, and have multiple users be able to access it. Let's design mm -hmm. something like that first. Okay, so so for a simple system like that, um, we can probably make the assumption that uh, a single user will be editing it at any given time. Yeah. So for that, it's, it's pretty simple to make. So I would make a database um, that would have you know my users and then a table with uh, with the documents, which can be a simple text field, and so every time a user wants to um, edit the document, uh, they can they can say, "I'll start editing." Then we will store in the database that this user has more or less like a, a mutex. So you get an exclusive lock, um, and you can after that point you can send you can edit the thing in your browser. Uh, you can you know send post requests or Internally modify the document in the database, and everybody else can can read that document that has access to it, but they cannot modify that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so when you're done, you say, you know, "I'm done." You release the lock, and then another user can can get the. Okay, okay that the sounds document. good. Let's let's go ahead and design the database then, and see how it looks like, mm -hmm. and then based on that, we can make okay. it more complicated. So I mean, I can start making the database schema. Um, so yeah, I'll create a simple user table for in the beginning, um, and let me. How should I? I'll just list the um, the fields of, of each table. So let's say we have a simple system with a username and a 
passwords and probably an ID, uh, which is not incrementing. Um, and maybe we have an email and other attributes. Uh, so I'll start with that one and then I'll create a document table, um, which will have the um, let's call it uh, oh, it's an area data and if only one person can have the log at any given time I can just store it here so uh, yeah. log user and I'll tell you how to use that um, and then we, we probably need to store um, which user has access to which document, so maybe user document would be another table with a user ID and friends ID. Um, okay, so the way the way the system works with this database is that normally uh, for every given document, log user is usually null, and that means that nobody has a log yet. Um, and if you try and access a document, let me just put 90 here, right here, um, and maybe I can just signify that these are foreign keys. So um, usually log user is null. Um, so when the user tries to access a document, we will only give access. We will, we will only say respond to the request if the user ID requesting the document has an entry this table, which is the access control table. Um, and we will only allow a user to modify the document if their user ID is in the log user. Um, and you can only get that one if it's, it's not like this. If some other user has a lock, you cannot take it. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, so let's um, yeah, let's um, let's talk about the protocol um, and how the user, the user's client, communicates with the server exactly. Even in, in the simple schema, maybe you want to have some sort of um, live updates. So if one person is editing, then the other should be able to see. How the document is evolving in real time. So how can mm -hmm. this network wise? Okay, so um, the simplest approach would be to um, have, you know, send the full copy of the document every time I change something. Um, so, well, let me just. So this is the backend slash database, and here we'll have a client. One and time two. Um, and let's say that this guy here has a log. Um, so the way it will work is you are modifying the document on your browser, um, and we can be sending the the document every you know whenever you type something. Uh, we can have some sort of debounce, uh, debounce and you know, you're typing out after you haven't typed anything for five seconds or something like that. We can send a copy back to the server. Um, here there is a WebSocket connection. And so when you, let's say, write So whenever you write a document over the WebSocket connection, uh, this can be many years, uh, you, we basically send a notification that says there is a change, and then these guys can just pull a new copy of the document. Um, now, this is, uh, you know, the, the bigger the document, the more network bandwidth you, you need to do this sort of thing. Um, so since this is text, we can do a lot of diff-based approaches, so we can either, um, we could probably uh, have some sort of diff uh, approach, 
uh, and sign with change, uh, but I will need to change the database for that. Okay, uh, so before we go into that, and before we make it multi multiplayer editing, before we add this ability, and before we do like diff based uh, change tracking, uh, let's quickly talk about the security of this protocol. So um, I, I would hope if there is a, some sort of uh, network attacker at this point, um, they should not be able to read what kind of document you're writing and what kind of document you're mm -hmm. reading. So what what cryptographic scheme would you use to protect this kind of data? Um, so this, I don't think this doesn't mean anything other than you know, a simple TLS uh, connection. So as long as the connections are over HTTPS to a domain that has a valid certificate signed by, by some CA, uh, that should be enough, and we can probably implement them with um, uh, some other security headers like HSTS or maybe public key pinging and, and these sort of things. Yeah, that sounds good. Great. All right, so let's let's get into the um, the diff based, based approach, and, and then um, the, the multi the multi user editing. Mm -hmm. So how would you approach that? Okay, so to make the diff based approach, and for that I would like also to have. Um, to be resilient to to be to off to network outages. So if this WebSocket connection goes off for five minutes, and during those five minutes you make changes, I would like this client to get a diff when they get back online. Um, and what I'm thinking is that in a similar manner to Git, um, I would like to be able to identify the state of a document in the past. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking of storing snapshots here instead of just a single mutable copy. Um, and therefore, you know, this guy will say, um, you know, give me, give me the latest snapshot, and this is a snapshot that I have. The server can use this to identifiers to calculate the diff uh, and send it back to the client. Cool. And this guy can apply that. Yeah, so, so even in, in this very simple system, if we have this new database, we can still have the new feature of showing the document history to the users, even if we don't use the multi-user feature at all, or the diff feature, right? So we can see that again. So, I mean, if we if we add the diffs that you're talking about, or uh, mm -hmm. rather the different versions, the yeah. snapshots, even if we don't take advantage of it for the diff or the multi-user editing, we can still have the feature of Google Docs where you can go back in time and say, Correct. you know, yeah. what is the document mm -hmm. two days ago? So maybe let's build that first and then use that to Make it sure. Okay. So, um, okay, so notionally, for there is a single document entity, and then its document entity has a list of revisions, and one of them is the latest. Okay. Um, so, what it can probably do is instead of having the data here, uh, let's say revision. And then create a revision table uh, that has the data now and it also has the documents. D um, and another ID pair. So that could work. So basically what happens here is for, for every document we can have a lot of revisions and Every revision can link back to the document. So, given a revision, we know which document is for. Um, we don't really need to store in a linked list manner to keep the ordering because we we know that for a, for for a set if we you know limit the revisions by document ID, we can just order them by the ID and, and see the um, their sequence. Um, and I would store the latest revision here, so that would be pointing to one of them. Yeah, why do you need to store the revision? Um, we don't really need to, you can just take you know, the latest ID. Um, so I can remove that. Yeah, I can probably remove that. I'm just, what, what I'm thinking is, um, well, I guess, I mean, I, just for performance reasons, but I'm not sure if it has any difference doing a select and getting the latest. Yeah, so, so before we, uh, we move on, let's talk about performance a little bit here on, on this database schema. Um, how would you ensure that 
this is performant for a large database. Um, so the first, the first thing that comes to mind is looking at the sort of queries I'm doing, the sort of fields I'm filtering with, and creating indexes for you know the things that I'm, uh, the things I'm using as predicates more often. Yeah. So, yeah. In this case, for example, here I know that I'll be very often be querying, getting revisions based on document ID. So here I would add an index on the document ID. Okay, and you mentioned that sometimes for a document we need to fetch the latest revision. Mm -hmm. um, so what kind of index would we need for that? Um, latest revision for a document. Well, here if I had an index based on uh, documents ID, comma, ID, um, I can easily guess the latest. Correct, yeah. So you'll use a multi volume index mm -hmm. on this pair. Yeah, that sounds great. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and do the smart diffs now. Okay. So okay, so now every client has a locally a current state. So this guy, so let's say this guy has version five and it's currently modifying that. So eventually uh, this guy will create version six, which doesn't exist yet. And then every client has some other version. So these, let's say this guy is uh, version two. Okay, so now you're allowing multiple people to edit, right? No. So this is what I'm saying too. It's the version that uh, this guy sees local because it ha they haven't seen the update yet. So maybe their their connection is off. Okay. Okay. So you still have one user that is editing. Right. Okay. Yeah. So this guy has a lock, um, and he's he's based on region five. Um, which is the, you know, when they when they started this is this was the latest version. Um, so at some point you uh, this guy will create version six uh, and send it over to so write document six here, and so then this guy will say, uh, yeah, give me give me revision six of that document and I have revision two locally. So how how will the client two know which is the latest version again? Right, so we still have the system where every time he writes, we send a notification with a WebSocket. Okay. But instead of these clients responding to the notification by fetching a brand new copy, uh -huh. they say, they, I mean, you, you can ask how you do that in the, in the API level can be different things. So this guy could request the latest revision and then do a second request asking for the diff, yeah. or he could just say, give me the latest based on that and have the server find out which is the latest one. Okay, um, so basically the server will reply, how can I, um, let's say here, let's say uh, div six, um, and then request will come back with the uh, difference, which can be a git diff based approach mm -hmm. or some other algorithm. and. Then this guy can apply and state will change to six here. Okay. Um, yeah, that, that looks very good. Um, so one question is, how does exactly the server calculate this diff here? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so when the request goes to the server and it's uh, diff of six and two, the server can just get grab the data for revision six and two, and yeah, I've been talking about the git diff um, algorithm. Um, so, I mean, you, you could use that algorithm and then to do the, the diff. Okay, so how would you use that algorithm? In terms of like implementing this? Okay, so, I mean, git comes with a uh, library, but I'm pretty sure for, uh, you know, I would Google for libraries that did text diffing. Anything. Okay, um, but you can also use the Git. Yeah, so Git you, library, you so. can definitely. I mean, it depends on, it, on your language runtime. So, you know, if it's if it's a um, if, an, if it's a non-compiled language, it might be tricky to get the native bindings if they don't exist yet, mm -hmm. um, and and link with the C library. If you're using C plus plus, it would be pretty easy to do that. Okay. Um, so yeah, it depends on how on the stack of the backend, I guess. Uh, yeah, that that sounds about right. 
Um, and, and it's a good idea to reuse libraries, of course. And, and then the other question is, how, how would the client, given the diff and the previous version, how would they resolve the latest version? Right, so you would still need the, uh, not the diff generation algorithm, but the diff, uh, the diff application algorithm on the client. So you definitely need JavaScript implementation uh, of whatever algorithm you use. Okay. So that's actually another consideration. If the Git algorithm does not exist in any JavaScript implementation, um, you know there are ways of, of using that on the, on, the, on the client, but they're pretty heavy. You know, compiling. Uh, you can compile a C library from the browser, but I would I wouldn't do that for you know, production users. It would be right. Hard. Right. Okay, that makes sense. Great. So. Um, yeah, that seems pretty fast, um, but we still have only one user who's editing, so maybe we can, um, we can fix mm -hmm. that problem now. Okay. Um, okay, let me, let me think. Um, so I'm trying, to, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think how the current Google Docs works when multiple people are editing. Uh, so the, the first thing I'm thinking about is that we could be running the diff algorithm on the client, and you know everybody can, can be sending diffs on the server. And in a trivial case where you don't have conflicts, everything is fine because uh, you know everybody gets the updates and applies them, and they're more or less in the same state. Mm -hmm. um, however, we do have a problem where I'm editing a line here, and another other guy is editing the same line. Okay. Um, so, so let's just assume that, for now, um, multiple people will not be editing the same exact lines, mm -hmm. but you will be working on the same document at the same time. So let's do that, that case first. All right. Um, OK, let me, let me think about this. Okay, so the so we no longer have a log here, um, so everybody can be accessing the documents at the same time, and so uh, I'm trying to explore what will happen. So let's say we, uh, every client has a version, has a revision of the document. They make some changes every now and then. They make a diff and they send it to the server. So, uh, so they don't write documents anymore. So write diff. Now, every time they write a diff, um, the server will get the diff. Uh, it, the server will apply the diff to the latest revision, create a new revision here, and reply with, you know, got it. Okay, and the latest revision is six. Um, now there is a problem here. So if they do that, then you know all the all the other clients can do the same. Can can receive the update because they're not editing the same line, um, and will get updates. The problem is what happens if um, let's move the lock. So if both are starting from Revision five. They both make a diff here. So write the diff. Um, so essentially, one of them will arrive first uh, to the server, and eventually the server will have two new revisions six and seven. So the response to its client has to not only say, "Okay, I got your diff," but also you know, other changes that happened while you were writing. Okay, so how, how does Git solve this problem exactly? Um, well, with Git, when you...
Well, with Git, you, in, order, in order to push a new version, you have to have the latest version. So when you attempt to write, you know, push a new commit um, to the master branch, which we have latest stuff in here. Um, if you don't have, if you if your diff is not based on the latest version, we'll say you have to pull first. So then you have to pull the new, the latest version. Uh, hopefully, you won't have any conflicts, and then retry. So I could do the same thing here, actually. Yeah, I think that's a good uh, idea. Yeah. So basically, um, you set a diff and you say my diff is based on version five. If while you do that, this document already has moved to version 6, the server will say you have an updated copy. So it will say, first pull down the new one uh, and reapply the diff. Uh, we assume that everybody is editing different lines so there will be no conflicts. And then you will retry uh, writing so you can get a new revision. Okay, so that's a little bit tricky, I think. Uh, so let's go through this real, like, real quick and, and describe a little bit more in a more detailed manner how would you apply this diff? Because if I've made some changes in revision 5 and I've created a new revision or, or just a diff and I send it to the server and then the server um, gives me revision 6, then that diff, is that valid for revision 6 or not? Or do I need to change the diff as well? Well, it depends. I mean, whenever you have a, a diff, at least in the Git world, uh, well, there is a context. Uh, so there's the line you change and there is context. Uh, before and after your changes. So as long as the con as long as you can match the context, uh, you can assume that the, the diff will apply. Okay. If you if you change, you know all but the line you change, you will probably not apply, and you want to resolve that line. Okay. So okay, we have um, we have the multi-user system with, with this, and then. Um, one question is, what happens if I remain online for a long time? How would you, how would you deal with this? Um, so is the question if you remain offline and do your offline changes for a long time as well? Yeah, you want to edit the document for a while. So you can say you're on a plane, you do some edits, you've opened the page, you do some edits, and then you land, you connect back. Um, mm -hmm. And then the problem is, if, if the client tries to write diffs during your flight, it will not work, so we mm -hmm. don't deal with that. But we can assume that no other people will be editing the same lines as you are doing during your flight, basically. So no conflicts, but you still need some sort of offline system. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the persistent layer doesn't have, to, like the, the browser doesn't have to depend on the server to uh, persist the document as you're editing it. So you can have a local cache, like you can use local storage for that. And, and keeping local data and anticipate that in the, sometime in the future you will get connect, a connection. And when you have a connection, you can sync your local states mm -hmm. with the server. Um, so, yeah, I would, I would basically store a copy locally and have a background job that will, try, will always try to sync the local state to the remote state. Okay, yeah, that sounds like a great design. Uh, and it will also work similarly on a mobile version, I guess. Mm -hmm. That could yeah. work really well. Um, okay, so um, we mentioned previously that if you use a context-based div, then the context may change, but the line, the line you're editing may not change under our assumptions. So um, let's make the following assumption that people are changing um, text around, around your line. They're not changing the line itself, but um, each time they're doing a change, it may be something small. So it might, you may change the line above a little bit, and then the line below a little bit, but not all of the lines at the same time. So if you go through the revisions, you can see a continuity of the document, right? Mm -hmm. but, but the problem is that with this system, if let's say I'm on version 5, and then I'm offline for a while, I change one particular line, and then eventually I go online, and I see we're at revision, let's say, you know, 80, Mm -hmm. um, then the diff I have from version 5 with this context will no longer apply. Mm -hmm. But there is enough information from version 5 up to 80 to build a new diff that can apply in version 80. So how would you do that? Hmm. So is, it, is the assumption that the line, so on revision 5 that my diff is based on, um, so I was working in a particular line. Is this line, is the assumption that this line will stay the same 
for until revision 80 and only the context changes. Yeah, but I mean, there may be new lines added and lines removed, but this particular line is still yours. So you have a like, pro-line block. Okay. Um, so if it's the same line, um, you can probably identify the line, and if the, if the surrounding lines have a few changes, you can probably do some sort of, um, not exact match, but see how, how different they are, and if they're you know, more than a certain threshold, uh, consider them completely different and, and, and fail. Otherwise, if they're, if they're not very different, um, assume that the context is fine. The other thing I'm thinking about is if you could do this uh, in a similar manner that Git does with base. Um, so basically, uh, what is it? Yeah, I'm not sure Git Git base solves the problem. I think that Git base would have the same issue with context. So, so let, me, let me just explain to you a little bit more clearly. So let's say you have here some line that says hello, and then maybe the hello line also exists farther below. So that's not the line you're editing, but this is the line you're editing. Mm -hmm. So you cannot just identify it with content. Um, but you, right. you want to have some sort of context around it. So mm -hmm. let's say here it has a 1, 2, 3, and then a 4, 5, 6. Right. So let's say this is revision 5, and then this evolves, and it, at revision, let's say, 70, there's been more lines added above here. So um, let's say there's some hash, and then there's some stars, and then this line has changed, and it says something completely different, like A, A, A. And then it has your hello here, and then here this has changed as well. So your diff will multiply to that. But um, this change from 5 to 70 happens slowly. So for example, in revision 6, you could say, oh, you know, the hash has been added. And then in revision 7, the stars have been added. And then in, in revision, let's say, 8, the 1, 2, 3, or well, the 1 changed into an A, and then in the next revision, the 2 and the 3 changed into a double A, and then this also changed slowly into that revision. So we have all this context information to be able to maybe rebuild this diff. Mm -hmm. But if you just try to apply it to revision 70, it will not work. Right, so... The one thing I'm thinking about is like, if you, you see it as a, you know, here you're on five, and then there's one branch of history that goes to six all the way up to, what is it, 70. And then you have your own diff that goes into six prime here. Mm -hmm. and, and the question is how you take that state and, and move it here essentially to make 71. Yeah. So I'm thinking that maybe um, because you have all these uh, diffs here, Maybe you could just break this one and start applying each one of them on top of each other to get the diff from here applied under six prime and arrive to seven prime and so on and so forth. And hopefully, if you if you have conflicts in the end, you will end up with seventy one prime, uh, which would be a, a combination of all the diffs so far. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this will be done on the client side. No, so that will be on the server side. So you, server, you because you don't want to, you know, retrieve all these things all the time. So mm -hmm. you would send, you know, I have this kind of diff, and I'm based on version five. The server can do all this thing, and if everything works, works out, it will say, "Good, I got your diff, and this is now the new version." Okay. So the server will say, "Okay, you started from version five. You have this diff. I can't apply it on seventy. So I'll do like gradual applications to get." New, newer and newer diffs, in a sense, and based on this latest diff, I can now apply it to version 70, get the new one, and then the client can download 71, and we will have their own changes and not everything else as well. Well, no, no, not quite. So, here, basically, you scrap all this history and you end up with a new chain of history. So, here you will have a version of the document that has not only your diff, but every other diff. So, this is, this is a revision by itself. Okay. It's not like you advance the, the diff. But but if I look at this revision, if I look at the history of the document, then um, my changes will be shown before everything else. Yeah. So it doesn't make sense. Because they were only uploaded, you know, when 71 was built. 
Well, I mean, it's a different thing. Um, like the chain doesn't necessarily show when it happened. Yeah. Um, so this, this can be other information like metadata, yeah, some sort of timestamp. Mm -hmm. um, the chain shows, you know, how the the diff were applied. So these are different things, I guess, and that's, that's also great. I mean, it applies on Git. You can have a commits that are their, their dates are not in order, basically. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that um, so the other thing you could do is, but basically when you reach that point uh, you will essentially have something like this document mm -hmm. uh, with the chains here so here you can actually diff these two here yeah and then you know have it, you know, maintain the property that every link has came after the previous ones. Right. So this can be a temporary kind of calculation. Find the final date and try to apply it. Okay. To so that um, would be most friendly point. Okay. Yeah. So then, one final question on this is: um, this this seven prime here is obtained by applying the diff of seven onto six prime. No. So this or, is this is six prime. Is the diff my diff based on five? Yeah. And seven prime is the diff from five to six applied on a short link, make it different numbers. The number system can make it uh, clearer. But seven prime gets produced by applying the diff from five to six that was on the server on the document that uh, I sent. Okay. Yeah. So you still need to like do multiple diffs between documents to be able to resolve this change. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. And then uh, I guess this solves most of the problem um, and works reasonably well. Um, my question is, my last question then is, well, at Google Docs, I never see any conflicts. So how do they do that? Um, well, while you don't see any conflicts, I'm pretty sure you will. Uh, you can see your changes disappear. Yeah. So. What I think is that they have an automatic resolution of conflicts and they choose the version based on when it can be the latest, the latest version. So if two people change the same word, one of them will win essentially. Yeah. Uh, so they don't, they, don't have, they don't require users to manually resolve and I guess that's a fair trade-off for people that have not used the right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, um, this looks like a great system. Um, one more question that I have is, this looks very similar to Git and Mint. Many ways. Mm -hmm. Do you think we could reuse Git as a backend for this system? Um, I would say unlikely. Um, unlike, unless we do massive modifications. The main thing I'm thinking about is that Git is a uh, file system based system, so it will impose a great load on the file system, um, and we wouldn't be able to reuse. You know, uh, scale the scaling we get with database systems or replication and these kind of guarantees we have. So that would be a big problem. Um, you know, giving sending all that load on the file system, and there are other considerations as well. So the file system, uh, I'm not sure if Git has been built with uh, durability in mind. So when the, when Git says you know I, this is written, I'm not sure, I'm not exactly sure if it actually writes it to. to back when we store the disk, for example, like a database. Okay. So there will be a lot of things to consider and find out on that side before, before using that. Um, and the other problem is that um, this is probably not an isolated system. Yeah. Um, so if you have other resources in the database that need to link to those resource, resources, um, it will be pretty hard to combine these two data stores together. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I think that's reasonable. Okay, well, um, that looks like a great solution. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Uh, and then, um, yeah, I think it was a very interesting problem. Yeah. All right, so I think uh, Petros more or less uh, nailed it. And um, I'll have uh, on the description of the video, I will have some sort of critique that I, I kept some notes here um, that state what things he did well and what things he did less well. 
Um, overall, I think this would be a, uh, a great answer to this question. So, and I think this is a this is generally a good question uh, for um, assessing the software design skills. It's it's quite often that large companies ask this kind of question. So, uh, what did you think about the problem? It was a really interesting problem. Uh, we didn't address the multiple uh, riders on the same line. So, I mean, and on an interview, that's probably. You know, it has to do. I've, I've I've read specifically at some point about these data structures that allow you to have multiple riders and have eventual consistent uh, data stores. And there are structures that allow you to make these these sort of operations on documents. So I think Google does not use a system, a simplistic system like Git. Uh, they have a more complicated algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, so, but yeah, it generally, was a really interesting problem. Uh, and touches definitely in a lot of areas. All right, well, thanks for your time. And uh, everyone, thanks for watching. Don't forget to Bye. hit the like button and subscribe, and I'll uh, see you next time.